week's science live session. My name is Amy Defoe. I'm one of the science teachers here at Graduation Alliance. Thanks for checking into this. Um, I hope that this session uh, is informative and helpful for you. Um, today we're going to be talking about homeostasis and scientific investigations. Of course, I built in some time within this live session for you to ask any questions that you may have. So before we go ahead and get started, a couple things. Um, housekeeping items. So again, welcome. Um, you have the option here that you can turn your video on, you can turn your video off, whatever your comfort level is there. I think it's kind of nice to be able to see each other. Yay, it's sunny outside here today. <laughs> nice to see, huh? Um, you can also, of course, meet yourself or unmute yourself. So you, if you've got some background knowledge, background noise going on behind you, please do go ahead and mute that. Um, but anytime you want to join in on the conversation, ask questions, give feedback, which I totally, totally am hoping that you want to do, um, go ahead and chime in. You can talk out loud or of course you can use that chat, chat box. Um, so you'll see me, I'll be checking the chat box throughout this session to see if any questions come in. So whatever mode of communication works best for you, be it um, speaking through your speakers or typing out a response or a question on that chat box. I'm thankful to get any. So whatever works for you guys. And again, you know, coming from um, an online kind of schooling standpoint here during these live sessions it is kind of, it's nice to get that interaction. So please do join in on the conversation in today's topics. Okay, these are being recorded. They're being recorded. Lots of good reasons. Of course, you know about this nice library that we have, the Teacher Mentor uh, YouTube channel, which has a collection of all of our live sessions through all of our courses here. Um, these are great because they're little um, videos that you can go and view anytime that is convenient for you. Um, if you're working on homeostasis and you weren't able to come to this session, you know, it'll be posted here in just a, a little bit and you can view that at a time that's appropriate for you. And as you're moving through your courses, you know, you might not be at this point in time. And as you move through these courses and you say, gee, I'm not really getting this concept or, you know, what are they asking for in this activity? You can go to this YouTube channel and you can take a look and you can filter it by um, different course. And you can look and see if there is a, a live session that is going to answer questions that you need help in. Pretty cool. So make sure that you're checking into that and using that as well. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started here. So let me show you. Um, today we're going to be talking about biology, semester one, unit two, um, is where we talk about homeostasis, but we also hear about homeostasis all through um, quite a few of the courses in science. So it's not just in biology semester one that we'll be talking about homeostasis. That's just kind of where the, the chunk of it, what I'm going to be talking about comes from. Same thing with scientific investigations. You know, we know that we're on in this kind of online community. And so our, our lab science is a little bit different than um, what you might have in a normal brick and mortar, but we still want to and still are going to provide you with information about scientific investigations so that you know kind of the procedure for doing them and actually how to carry them out. And we do have some um, examples of some, you know, kind of online labs. And in some of the courses, you actually have hands-on labs that you, you do as well. Okay. So again, that topic continues through every branch and course in science. So let's take a look at our schedule here for today. Talking about homeostasis, the characteristics of life, so what it means to be considered living. Um, and then we'll have our first question and answer period. And then I'll go in and I'll talk about scientific investigations, kind of that skill part. And then we'll end with question and answer and make sure you're set and ready to go for the rest of the week. Okay, so let's get started. Let's talk about this. Characteristics of life. So um, an organism, what does it mean to be considered living? You know, is there certain criteria or characteristics that people or a scientist will say, oh, okay, that's a living organism and that's not a living organism. So, you know, some examples here is a rock living, is water living, soil, you know, what are the characteristics of living organisms? And, you know, what about things that um, are, are, are dead or decayed? Um, would that be considered living because it once was? How do we go about determining this? Any ideas? Well, to be considered a living organism, um, we do have the characteristics of life. And um, this is something that scientists put out that gives us kind of nice criteria. So it makes this nice for us to 
go down the line and say, yes, you are living. No, you are not living. Um, so all living things, no matter how different they are from each other, uh, or they may be, they all share a set of common characteristics. So that's pretty crazy to think like, yeah, okay, I'm living, you're living, um, but you're going to compare me to this little, you know, one cell little, I don't know, maybe that's an amoeba, you know, kind of, kind of silly, but we're going to go into this and we're going to find out what those characteristics are like, uh, characteristics of life are. So the biggest one, um, characteristics of life, number one, cellular organization. That means all living organisms are made of the small building blocks that we called cells. Um, as we learned in unit one, cells are the basic unit structure and function in an organism. Um, organisms can be composed of one cell. We call that unicellular. So think of like a, um, a unicycle. It just has one wheel. Same thing for an organism that's just one cell, unicellular. Tiny, huh? Um, or it could be mini cells, multicellular, like what you see here. <laughs> That's me, multicellular, same with you. Okay, so multicellular made up of mini cells, unicellular is made up of one cell, the whole entire organism's body, just one cell. Oh my goodness. Okay, so that's the first characteristic. All living organisms need to be composed of a cell or mini cells. Okay, second one chemicals and life. Um, the cells of living things are made of chemicals, and most abundant chemical uh, in cells is water. Carbohydrates are a cell's main energy source. Two other chemicals, proteins and lipids, are the building blocks of cells. Um, also, we have nucleic acids, which are the kind of genetic material of the cell. And this acid contains chemical instructions to carry out the functions of life, DNA. Okay, so all living organisms are made up of a set of chemicals, okay? And of course, lots of water. Energy use. Organisms get energy from taking in and breaking down materials. Metabolism is the word to describe the process of organisms taking in and using up materials. The cells use energy to carry out functions like growing and repairing injured parts. Okay. And we didn't talk about in there, so it talks about energy use. We all, all organisms need energy. Okay. They need a way to keep that metabolism, to keep those functions in their body, in those cells, continuously processing, growing, repairing, building, um, providing energy, moving around materials that all takes up energy. What it doesn't say in there is how that energy or where that energy comes from. Okay. Cause we know that we have some organisms that can make their own food through photosynthesis, but again, they do need energy. And they do need materials to create that energy. Okay. We got other organisms like us that are consumers. You know, we consume materials. Okay. Same thing with producers, they consume materials. It's just in a different format. Okay. So that's it. Energy. We all need energy, right? We have to, you eat to live. <laughs> um, the next one here respond to response to surroundings. So a response is like an action, okay? Usually it's represented by a stimuli. Something um, internally makes your body respond. So you can see some examples here, you know, like, oh, you touch something hot, that's a stimulus, okay? It's creating this reaction, okay? That response is, you know, you quickly, without even a response, without even thinking about it, it's automatic, you know, you move your hand back, okay? That's responding to um, a stimulus. Let's see what it here says. Have you ever seen a plant in a sunny window? You may notice how it grows or leans towards that light. Like a plant growing towards the light, all organisms react to changes in their environment. A change in an organism's surrounding that causes a change is called a stimulus. Some examples are lights, sounds, other organisms, an organism reacts to a stimulus with what we call a reaction, a response in action, or a change in behavior. Um, there's this huge, huge study, um, pretty famous study about Pavlov's dogs. You maybe you've probably seen that before, um, where you think about a dog hears like a doorbell or a bell, and instantly, you know, that's the stimulus. Is you know, you hear this this um, knock or a bell ring and the dog responds to that stimulus as barking, you know, like somebody comes to your door. Okay. That's another example of a stimulus. But, you know, as we think in other organisms, they're very, very different. And take this little centipede thing. Okay. The stimulus, um, if somebody touches it, it's an automatic reaction or response to curl up in a little ball protection. Okay. 
characteristics of life continuing. All living organisms grow and develop. So all things um, grow and develop and we have these kind of life stages. So we all start out as tiny babies and we grow into adults. Um, development is the process of change that occurs during an organism's life to produce a more complex organism. In order to grow and develop, organisms use energy to create new cells. Um, cells don't live forever. And of course, we know that we continue to grow. As we continue to grow, we get more and more cells. Okay, so we all grow and develop. We have different stages of our life. Reproduction. All organism, organisms have the ability to reproduce or produce offspring that are similar to the parents. Asexual reproduction involves only one parent and it produces offspring that are identical to the parent. This usually happens, this is like what we're talking about in one single celled organisms, make an exact replica of themselves. And that's asexual reproduction, only one parent, one cell. Sexual reproduction involves two parents, combines that genetic information together to produce an offspring that differs from both parents, but of course has the similarities in the genetic material from both of those parents. Humans, of course, we reproduce sexually. Okay, so all living organisms can reproduce. So is it living? <laughs> it's kind of silly to think about. So here we have an example. This is an amoeba. Do you guys know about amoebas? What do you think? Is it living? Is it non-living? Well, let's see. Let me tell you some characteristics about it. It is made of a cell. It's unicellular. Uh, it needs energy. It needs to provide food. Uh, it, has chem it needs chemicals to make up its body and water. It responds to its surroundings. If you've ever seen an amoeba move, it kind of moves by squishing. So if you were to probably touch it, it would squish up to kind of get away. Defense mechanism. What other ones am I missing? Responds to stimuli, grows and develops. I think that was it. So yes, an amoeba is a living thing. <laughs> How about a fire? That's a tricky one because people are like, well, it needs materials, right? It needs oxygen. It needs something to burn, like wood. Um, it moves, it responds, it grows. <laughs> but no, it is not living. It does not reproduce. It is not made up of cells. How about a snowman? <laughs> My kids would like that. Sure it is, right? No, a snowman is not living. It is not made up of cells. It's made up of H2O in the form of um, a solid ice. Okay. How about a tree? This one, people are like, what? Well, yeah, it's living. Okay, but does a tree move? That's the trick question, huh? You see this question in, um, in the biology course, too, a couple times in there. Um, yes, a tree is living. So as we think about it, yes, we can say it's made up of cells. It grows, it develops, it reproduces, it needs energy. Um, it responds to um, its surroundings. And people are like, well, then how does, what about moving? How does it move? How does it tree move it doesn't get up and walk on its roots no but as we know with a tree like you might see a tree um, it grows in the direction of sunlight that's a form of moving um, it spreads its its leaves open to collect that sun sunshine or it opens its flowers um, to collect more of that sunshine that's those are all forms of moving same thing with its branches moving outward growing outward that's a form of moving uh, its roots digging deep into the ground and spreading out, also a form of moving. Okay, so we talked about characteristics of life. So then how does an organism maintain this? Like, how do we just keep on living? How, does it, how do we keep growing? And uh, How does it all work? Well, that's homeostasis. And homeostasis is a state in which everything within the cell is at equilibrium and functioning properly. The same thing goes with the whole organism as well. So as we, we think about um, the makeup of an organism, we have cells, cells combined to make tissues, tissues combined to make organs, organs combined to make organ systems, which create the whole entire organism depending on what type of organism that it is. We know that some organisms, again, are just one cell. And so they don't have that complete functioning there. So homeostasis, again, um, takes place in cells. And it also, uh, we talk about the state of being in homeostasis equilibrium uh, as with, with the whole entire organism.
Okay, the state of homeostasis keeps the cells constant with what it needs to function. So that could mean that, you know, it's getting the right amount of water. So it's taking in liquid or it's filled up with too much liquid and it gets rid of liquid. It moves um, materials that I might need like energy sources, sugars in and out of its body, waste products, got to get those out in and out of its body. So it's maintaining this constant um, balance for what it needs to function. Okay. Uh, this means in homeostasis, the waste is being transported away from the cell while it receives the nutrients it needs to continue to function. The structure primarily responsible for this is the cell membrane. So think of the cell membrane as like um, a bigger picture of it would be like your skin. Okay. Your skin has tiny little pores on it, little openings that allows things to come in and out of your body. And it acts as this like barrier, right? Otherwise you'd see, you know, we've got blood and muscle and tissue that would be exposed, okay? So think of it like a gatekeeper and that's what we call the cell membrane. So the outside layer of each cell is called the cell, cell membrane. And again, it functions by letting certain things in and certain things out. Um, there's different ways that materials can move through the body. And the biggest one is passive transport and passive. So if you think of somebody's passive, they're like, oh, sure, whatever, you know, not too hard, not too strict. They're kind of easy going. And passive transport kind of goes along with that. That's how I remember a passive. It requires no energy for this, for the moves, the, for the materials moving in and out of the cell. So that's the kind of energy um, that we would prefer to have is passive energy. We do know that sometimes energy is required. We just don't want to use up our energy needs through moving materials. We can do it passively. Okay. Um, two big ways uh, to... Two words that we use to describe the movement of materials. The first one is diffusion. And this is the movement of materials down the concentration grade. So it spreads out evenly from high to low. Um, you think about an example here they give is spraying perfume, okay, or cologne. You spray it, you know, right next to you, you smell it super strong. So you have a high concentration of those kind of fragrance molecules. But eventually what happens? It spreads out. So you've been into a room, you know, right? You spray it. It doesn't just stick in that one spot where it's sprayed. Rather, it fills that whole entire room over time. And that's what diffusion is talking about, is it, it goes from a high concentration until it spreads out to an even concentration of those molecules. Okay? So um, osmosis is the diffusion or the movement of water through cells. So it's the same thing, going from an even grade of amounts okay so everything wants to be nice and equal so all living things must have food water living space and stable internal conditions which we call homeostasis um how homeostasis works to maintain homeostasis organisms are either a conformer or a regulator um, conformers are organisms whose bodies change to the environment. The environment determines what the body does. For example, some organisms have a wide range of body temperatures, um, and they depend on, it depends on what the outside environment. We call those organisms ectotherms, and you can probably think of some reptiles, right? Okay, so ectotherms, their body temperature is determined by outside um, by the outside environment. So we have got, those are the ectotherms. So they don't have this, like we think in humans, we have this normal um, body temperature, right? They take our temperature and, you know, they swipe it across and it's like, okay, you're 98.6, you're healthy, right? These organisms, it fluctuates depending on what's going around in their, in their outside um, environment. And that's normal for them. Okay. Regulators, on the other hand, they try to maintain this constant level, even with variations in the environment. We call those endotherms. So we're, we're working on our temperatures inside, endo meaning inside, okay? These include mammals, which maintain a constant body temperature. Uh, one advantage of homeostatic regulation is that it allows the organism, organism to function effectively in a broad range of conditions. So for example, you think of these two organisms here, a bobcat, which is an endotherm, so its temperature is regulated inside, um, a snake, on the other hand, ectotherm, outside temperature. So what happens when it's really cold for a snake? Do you see it, you know, moving around? No, it's these types of organisms, they kind of go into like a, a shutdown. Their um, energy consumption 
is reduced. They don't move as much. They're slower because their bodies um, are having to deal with that lower, lower temperature. Bobcats and endotherm on the other side have this natural internal temperature regulation. And of course, we need energy to keep that energy, to keep that temperature right. You know, we can think about that different temperatures they're still going to be able to function. You know, when it's 30 degrees outside, you can still go outside and run, right? And it's 70 degrees outside, you can still go outside. You know, you might feel the differences in the temperatures, but your body can still maintain. It doesn't slow you down as much, okay? But of course, that takes energy for endotherms to keep that constant temperature. So let's think, homeostasis in humans. Can you think of ways humans respond to maintain homeostasis? Yeah, there's an image there to help you. <laughs> okay, so again, we're responding to a stimulus. So let's take a look here. Um, we got two different ones. We're looking here at temperature in this little cartoon here to show us. You know, as temperatures rise, we know that, okay, so our bodies maintain this temperature. And as temperatures rise, our, our bodies get out of equilibrium. So homeostasis becomes unbalanced. And so our body tries to find a way to control that environment and get it back to that equal state. So when it's warm out, we sweat. So sweating, it produces, it moves moisture out of your body onto your skin, which then cools your body down. Okay, so that's a form of cooling to regulate a response to the stimulus of a too warm of a temperature. Take that the opposite way. Think of um, when it's cold. Okay, our body, we shiver. And that shivering creates little tiny muscle contractions that creates energy. It uses energy, but it also creates energy to warm our bodies up to keep us going, right? So that we're keeping that normal temperature. Okay, so those are two examples of in humans responding to um, how we can maintain homeostasis. Um, you think about that when you're thirsty and you're dehydrated, you get signs of dehydration, you get that internal you know, need or thirst. I'm really, really thirsty. That's your body responding to the stimulus that you need water. Okay, let's take a look at some of these questions here. The body systems work together to maintain internal conditions or, so again, maintaining internal conditions is called, that's right, homeostasis. Okay, and this comes from activity two, three, one. In endotherms, their body temperatures change with the environment. So endo, think inside. That is false. Endotherms create, have a um, maintained internal body temperature. An example of how temperature can affect homeostasis, higher temperatures can cause you to shiver, lower temperatures can cause you to sweat. Flip that around, that's right, that is false, that's right. Um, higher temperatures are gonna cause you to sweat to cool down your body, lower temperatures are gonna cause you to shiver to create energy from muscle spasms. Osmosis is the diffusion of water through a cell membrane. That it is. So again, we're evening out that concentration of water to make this nice and equal. Passive transport requires no energy. That is true. So think passive, easy going, no energy. Uh, which of these is not a characteristic of living things? Not a characteristic. Requires energy, is made of cells, reproduces sexually, and grows. Oh, that's a trick one there. Okay, because we can look at this and we can say, wait a minute, is made of cells. Well, there's some organisms that are um, multicellular and unicellular, so I need to change that. Is made of a cell or many, which we know is true. Okay, reproduces sexually. Okay, this is not a characteristic of all living organisms because we know that some organisms reproduce asexually. So if it just said reproduces, then these would all be examples of characteristics. But because it says reproduces sexually, that is incorrect. Um, just that an organism reproduces, but not all organisms reproduce in the same way. Okay, so that is not true. The main part of a cell that maintains homeostasis is the, and this comes from the lesson, um, it is the nucleus. So the nucleus is like the command center, like we have the brain of our body and our 
whole entire organ system body. Um, the brain is like our command center. It tells the body what to do, carries out the functions, kind of controls it all. That's what happens in the cell. That's the nucleus. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, let's move on to scientific investigations. Okay, so the scientific method, scientific investigations. Scientists use investigations or experiments to answer questions or to solve a problem. When conducting a scientific investigation, there are steps to complete to ensure accuracy. And you can see these steps here on the side, which we're gonna go over. So again, the purpose of say a laboratory experiment, an investigation, um, whatever it is that you like to name it or call it, the point of it is to answer a question or solve a problem. And that's what we do in science, is we answer questions that we have. Okay, um, let's take a look at what these are. Um, the steps of the scientific method. So we always start off with this question, okay? And the question has to be something that's testable. Okay, so it has to be something that we can um, change and that we can measure. Okay, and there's different things that we can measure. It could be qualitative or quantitative. So qualitative could be observations that we make, could be um, a way to measure, but we also think of quantitative being number. Hello, we're talking about steps to the scientific method. Um, so as we're um, talking about qualitative and quantitative, you know, we can have data collections that are just made by the observations that we see. Um, but quantitative, again, those are talking about measuring something with numbers. So, you know, how many minutes, how many seconds, um, the length, those types of things, okay? And with the scientific method, when we start talking about a question, we need to have a question that is testable. And you probably think about this if you've ever been to a science fair before or something. And, you know, the common one is, why is the sky blue? Well, okay, that's a great question. Of course, we want to know, and science can help you understand that. But how are you going to go about testing that? So there's a difference. How would you test why, how the sky is blue? So that's an example of a question that um, is not testable, okay? So we want to think about... Uh, when we write up our question, we use variables. So what it is that we are changing and then what it is that we are measuring, okay? So when we write a question, it should be written showing the relationship between the two types of variables, okay? So how does blank affect blank? Um, in these two variables, we talk about the manipulated variable and the responding variable. Just like we talked about mm, with homeostasis, you know, a stimulus and then a response. Okay, that stimulus is like the um, manipulated variable. It's like, what are you changing? And then of course the response is what happens because you change that. So we've got this example here. How does the amount of light affect plant growth? Okay, so we're looking at the relationship between blank and blank. So we're looking at how does light, amount of light affect plant growth? Okay, so our stimulus here is that amount of light. The effect is the plant growth. That again is what we can measure, okay? So here this is testable because we can actually, you know, take a plant and we can change the amount of light that it gets in a nice controlled environment, okay? Um, usually our questions are people, well, how do we come up with a question? That's always the hardest part for me. Well, questions come from our observations. So it's something that you notice, something that catches your eye, makes you question, wonder about. And that's where science gets us thinking. Okay, after you come up with your question, you come to this hypothesis and it's, it's an educated guess about what you think is gonna happen and of course, why. So we all want, always wanna back ourselves up. Um, so as we think about this, why would we wanna make an educated guess when we're actually gonna test it? Well, because we wanna get our minds thinking, we wanna activate and go back into our brain and see, do we already have knowledge about this topic? You know. What kind of variables or outside factors do I maybe need to consider when doing this investigation? Okay, so hypothesis just gets our mind thinking about this topic and gathering all the information that we already have about it to then help us complete this investigation. So what do you guys know about the amount of lights affecting plant growth already? You know, what do you think is going to happen? 
if we give it no light, what's going to happen to that plant? Okay. Yeah, totally. It's going to die if it does not have light. Okay. If there is more light, then the plant will grow faster because plants, think about it, what does a plant need to, um, oops, I want to close that out. Sorry. Um, so we think about, you know, the necessities the organism needs. <laughs> yep. Um, plants need light to grow. And for photosynthesis, for the for producers, which plants are, for them to be able to produce their own food energy, um, they need that sunlight. So, yeah, totally. If there's more light, then the plant's going to grow faster. You could take it the other direction. And you say, if there's no light, the plant's not going to grow. It's going to die. It's not going to be able to um, produce energy. Okay, so going back to those variables, this is a, a big piece, and you'll see these continuously through all of your science courses, okay? Um, so there are three main variables that we have in the experiment. The manipulated variable, again, this is the variable that you are changing to see its effect, okay? The example we talked about, you know, the, how light affects plant growth. So the light is what would be manipulated. It's the one that you are changing. So maybe you set up an experiment and you have one that has no, a plant that has no light, and you have a plant that has, you know, um, 12 hours of light. And then you have another plant that has 24 hours of light. So you manipulate, you change the amount of light to see its effects. Okay. You can think about maybe you're doing a test with some um, water. You could, you know, have different temperatures of water. Those would be manipulated variables, um, amounts of water, different. Okay. And again, the responding variable is what happens because of what you changed. It's what you measure. Okay. What, you, what you're collecting that data on. Going back to the light in the plant example, the responding variable is going to be that plant growth. So in that investigation, you would actually have a setup procedure of how you would go about collecting that data. So you would take measurements, you know, maybe you're measuring it every five days. Um, you would measure it so that then you can collect that data and you can come back and analyze it, which we're going to get to. Getting ahead of myself. Okay. The other variable is what we call the controlled variable. And this is one that stays the same so that you have something to compare your results to. Okay, so if you were working with a temperature, maybe you have manipulated the temperature and you had a hot, a warm temperature, and you had a cold temperature. Well, then you, the one, the controlled variable would be, you know, that room temperature. It hasn't been heated. It hasn't been cooled. It's like a constant. Um, it's what we can make a basis off of to compare those two. Um, I always like to say some with students are like, well, I, you know, I changed all of them. If you, you know, if you're doing a, um, a length, maybe you're measuring, you're manipulating the distance of, of an object. Um, I always say it's that, take that middle one. And that would be kind of your controlled one. So it's not the highest, it's not the lowest, but it would be your middle ground because then you can say, hey, here's the middle, here's the average of the two. And you can see the effects to the high range and you can see the effects to the low range. So it gives us something to compare the results. Okay. Oh, after we set that up, so we have our question, we have our hypothesis, and then we set up a procedure. And again, the procedure is kind of, it's like the written form of how we're going to carry out this experiment. And, you know, lots of people, lots of students were like, oh, I just want to get to the experiment, right? I just want to do it. I want to test my results. Well, that's great. We're going to get there, but we need to set it up in a way that it's detailed, um, that it's, it's the same every time that you do it. Um, if you do, you do repeated trials that you're making sure that you're completing the steps in the same order. Um, we do this to make sure that our results are consistent and that of course it's reliable. Okay. So you would set off and you would set up your materials. And of course you want to make sure you have all the materials before you start the experiment, right? Um, maybe you've done this before in your life. You went to go make, you know, cookies or something like that and you didn't have any eggs. Well, that's why we have to make sure that we're prepared before we begin by making sure we have all the materials on our list because then you can't carry it out. Okay. Then we have the procedure. And then again, that's the step-by-step -step detailed of how the experiment will be performed. You want it so detailed that somebody else could take your experiment and do it the same way. So you would want to have details in there, like how much. So you would actually want to say, you know, like 50 milliliters, or if you were doing a time, you know, count for 20 seconds. So you want it nice and detailed in there. 
And then of course you want to create a data table. You have to create some way to create um, a way to collect your data so that you can then go and analyze it and answer your question. Okay. You can't just answer, oh, the plant grew because the light was on. Well, how do you know that? You've got to back it up. And so we think about, well, what is our evidence to back it back up the question? And that's your data. So your data becomes your evidence in your experiment. So you want to make sure that you have it set up with labels. You know, um, so we've got, you know, like the title, this is going back to that light plant growth. And you can see here, I've got my man manipulated variables. And then here's going to be my responding variable, what I'm measuring. And again, we have a consistency going by week. And then it's always nice to have an average so that we can look at it through the big picture at the end. Okay. Then you need to carry out your experiment. Once your data table is set up, your procedure is set, you have all your materials, you're ready to go. So here you carry out your procedure following um, what you have written down on your investigation. And as you're carrying that out, you're writing in your data table. Please don't ever say like, oh, I'll, I'll come back to my data table. No, write it down as you're doing it, okay? You wanna make sure it's consist consistent and accurate. Then once you have your procedures carried out, um, again, we do multiple trials to make sure that it's not just a fluke that something happened. We want to make sure that we have consistent results. And then you get to go to your conclusion. And in your conclusion, conclusion, this is where you use your data to answer that investigative question that you were testing. So your conclusion answers the question that you had at the beginning of your investigation. And again, the data serves as that evidence to help prove and support your ideas. So in all your different courses that you go through, you know, you hear talk about supporting details. What's your evidence? Well, in science, we use our data as our evidence. So going back to what we were talking about with plant growth and life, um, light, my hypothesis was correct because the amount of light does affect plant growth. From my data, I can see that the plant grew differently. The plant with no light did not grow. The plant with natural light grew six centimeters. The plant with the lamp grew 10 centimeters. This showed that the plants that receive more light grow faster and taller because 10 centimeters is more than six centimeters. I know you're thinking, well, that's a lot. Well, yes, but it's providing that evidence to make it concise and make it detailed and showing that yes there is evidence to support this okay so what i like to say in a conclusion is there's like three main parts we always start off with talking about our hypothesis was your hypothesis right or wrong and of course why why was it right why was it wrong and then i like to go to the data from my data and this is here you can just say well, what happened what did you see and you can use your averages for each one of your variables. Just write out what happened for each one of them. Then we get to the concluding statement, okay? And this is where you answer that investigative question using evidence. This shows the plant that received more light grow faster and taller because right here, 10 centimeters is more than six centimeters. So we're showing this evidence um, that yes, the plant that has more light grows faster. So we're answering our question and here it is showing you right there. There's our evidence. Okay, think about some, we talked about homeostasis. Think about some experiments you could design around homeostasis. So thinking about um, our bodies maintaining these regular conditions, equilibrium. Do you think you could test, find something that you could test on? How does light affect plant growth? This is one, how does exercise affect heart rate? Okay, just to get your mind thinking there. Okay, um, in activity 2.41, you have some um, multiple choice questions that go along with uh, scientific investigation. So making sure that you understand the concepts from that. So again, going back to that responding variable, again, var variables are so big, you guys. The responding variable is what you are blank based on the changes of the manipulated variable. So again, what is that responding variable? What does it do for us or what part does it play in the investigation? If you said measuring, that is correct. So the responding variable is the one that you are measuring, 
Okay, it's what you're collecting your data on. In the following lab problem, what is the manipulated variable? How does light affect plant growth? So again, here we've got this effect. So we know we've got variable and variable. So which one, which one changes? So remember manipulate means to change. It's light, so we change the different amounts of light. The controlled variable in an investigation is not needed, I hope not, <laughs> is what is measured, stays the same to provide a comparison or it can be changed. So think of controlled, you're controlling something. You're keeping it the same to provide a comparison. The manipulated variable is what you are measuring in an investigation. Is that true or false? Are you measuring the manipulated variable? Think about what this word means, manipulate. That is false. Manipulated variable is what we are changing. Again, you manipulate, think about it in terms of, um, you know, in, in personal relationships or talking with somebody, you manipulate their viewpoint. You're changing their viewpoint. So the manipulated variable is the one that you are changing, not measuring, changing. So that is false. Okay. Number of the steps to carry out an investigation. So again, number one, we always state the problem in the question. Two, we make a hypothesis. Three, we gather our materials, we write out our procedure, we make that data table, we get all set, prepared to go, preparation, then we carry out the procedure. As we carry out the procedure, we collect our data and we write up our conclusion, answering that question with the evidence we just collected. Okay, so again, as we talk about scientific investigations, um, we know in these courses that you do have opportunities to think about investigations and actually um, go through a couple investigations. Some of them are through videos that you see or watch or demonstrations, but you also have some that are um, some virtual investigations too. And then in some of the other courses, you actually get to do some um, smaller labs at home. So again, you're getting these steps to this investigation and the parts of the investigation here in these courses. But I want to make sure that we kind of go over and think about those steps and make sure we understand why we do them, what the points are, why they're important, uh, and also those variables, because those are always going to be there. And you're going to continue to see this again, the same steps, the same variables, the same kind of set procedure, you're going to see through all of your science courses. This is the scientific method. <laughs> okay, does anybody have any questions about, um, we talked about homeostasis earlier and the characteristics of life. And then we talked about scientific investigations. You can ask a question about this, or this is also a great opportunity if you have questions about a topic that you're working with or an activity that you're working on. This is a great place to get those questions answered. So it doesn't have to be about the topic that we just talked about. Give you a little moment there. Again, you're welcome to unmute yourself. You're also welcome to use that chat box, whatever your mode works for you. Okay. I'm gonna keep talking. So if you have questions, just go ahead and shoot them to me. Um, thinking ahead, you know, we know we have these live sessions and we know that sometimes they're convenient for you and other times they're not. So again, you also have those opportunities to view these sessions on that teacher mentor YouTube channel where all of these lessons go. So please use that as you come along and move through your courses and you come across a topic, maybe a topic that just it's not sitting right, you know, check out, go to the live session, go to science and um, you can see which ones have been done. And again, sometimes having somebody else say it out loud, say it in a different way, show a different picture, an example, it makes that click. Okay. So use those. Same thing with the activities. You know, we go through these um, you know, the activities and um, kind of give you some, a little bit more guidance. Okay, and of course you also have communications with um, 
your teacher. So we're here to help support you. So if you have questions throughout the week, please don't wait for the live session. You can send us a chat, send us an email, um, send us a Google voice, whatever your mode of communication is, that works, okay? So we never want you guys to get to that point where you're feeling struggling, unmotivated, oh, science. Mm. Go ahead and, you know, first thing first, see if you can figure it out. Go to your teacher, ask for help. And that's what we're here to do is to help support you guys. If you have ideas for topics um, for live sessions, please let me know. You can tell me here. You can send me again any type of communication. Let me know if you have an idea for a live session that you would like to see. I would love to make these um, worthwhile, convenient for you if you have a time too. Let me know. Okay, guys, we're going to go ahead and sign off here for today. Thanks for joining. Good luck in science and 